My name is Aram, and welcome to the first episode of the storytelling podcast of Now and Then. My goal with this show is to transform fictional stories about the past, present, and future into audio dramas with rich music, voiceovers, and sound effects. Some of these tales, as the one I have selected to launch this series, will be short stories with a single narrator. Others will be full novels broken into chapters with guest vocal talent from the Chicago area. If you would like to support the show, head on over to ofnowandthen.com where I've got links to our Patreon account and official t-shirts. For those of you joining us from my other podcast, an original fantasy story told by playing, recording, and heavily editing a Dungeons & Dragons game called God's Fall, I think you will enjoy the tales I have selected for Season 1. If any of you have suggestions for future episodes, please do not hesitate to contact me on Twitter at ofnowandthen. And with that out of the way, let's get on with the show. American Fairy Tales by Lindman Frank Baum, published in 1901, The Glass Dog. An accomplished wizard once lived on the top floor of a tenement house and passed his time in thoughtful study and studious thought. What he didn't know about wizardry was hardly worth knowing, for he possessed all the books and recipes of all the wizards who have lived before him, and, moreover, he had invented several wizardments himself. This admirable person would have been completely happy but for the numerous interruptions to his studies caused by folk who came to consult him about their troubles, in which he was not interested, and by the loud knocks of the iceman, the milkman, the baker's boy, the laundryman, and the peanut woman. He never dealt with any of these people, but they rapped at his door every day to see him about this or that or try to sell him their wares. Just when he was most deeply interested in his books or engaged in watching the bubbling of a cauldron, there would come a knock at his door. And after sending the intruder away, he always found he had lost his train of thought or ruined his compound. At length, these interruptions aroused his anger, and he decided he must have a dog to keep people away from his door. He didn't know where to find a dog, but in the next room lived a poor glassblower with whom he had a slight acquaintance. So he went into the man's apartment and asked, where can I find a dog? What sort of dog? inquired the glassblower. A good dog. One that will bark at people and drive them away. One that will be no trouble to keep and won't expect to be fed. One that has no fleas and is neat in his habits. One that will obey me when I speak to him. In short, a good dog, said the wizard. Such a dog is hard to find, returned the glassblower, who was busy making a blue glass flower pot with a pink glass rose bush in it having green glass leaves and yellow glass roses. The wizard watched him thoughtfully. Why cannot you blow me a dog out of glass? He asked presently. I can, declared the glass blower. But it would not bark at people, you know. Oh, well, fix that easily enough, replied the other. If I could not make a glass dog bark, I would be a mighty poor wizard. Very well. If you can use a glass dog, I'll be pleased to blow one for you. Only you must pay me for my work. Certainly, agreed the wizard. But I have none of that horrid stuff you call money. You must take some of my wares in exchange. The glassblower considered the matter for a moment. Could you give me something to cure my rheumatism? He asked. Oh, yes, easily. Then it's a bargain. I'll start the dog at once. What color of glass shall I use? Pink is a pretty color, said the wizard. And it's unusual for a dog, isn't it? Very, answered the glassblower. But it shall be pink. So the wizard went back to his studies and the glassblower began to make the dog. The next morning, he entered the wizard's room with the glass dog under his arm and set it carefully upon the table. It was a beautiful pink in color, with a fine coat of spun glass, and about its neck was twisted a blue glass ribbon. Its eyes were specks of black glass, and sparkled intelligently, as do many of the glass eyes worn by men. The wizard expressed himself pleased with the glass blower's skill, and at once handed him a small vial. This will cure your rheumatism, he said. But the vial is empty, protested the glass blower. Oh no, there is one drop of liquid in it, was the wizard's reply. Will one drop cure my rheumatism? inquired the glass blower in wonder. Most certainly, that is a marvelous remedy. The one drop contained in the vial will cure instantly any kind of disease ever known to humanity. Therefore, it is especially good for rheumatism. But I got it well, for it is the only drop of its kind in the world, and I've forgotten the recipe. 
Thank you, said the glassblower, and went back to his room. Then the wizard cast a wizzy spell and mumbled several very learned words in the wizardy's language over the glass door. Whereupon the little animal first wagged its tail from side to side, then winked his left eye knowingly, and at last began barking in a most frightful manner. That is, when you stop to consider the noise came from a pink glass dog. There is something almost astonishing in the magical arts of wizards. Unless, of course, you know how to do the things yourself, when you are not expected to be surprised at them. The wizard was as delighted as a school teacher at the success of his spell, although he was not astonished. Immediately, he placed the dog outside his door, where it would bark at anyone who dared knock, and so disturb the studies of its master. The glassblower, on returning to his room, decided not to use the one drop of wizard cure-all just then. My rheumatism is better today, he reflected, and I will be wise to save the medicine for a time when I am very ill, when it will be more of service to me. So he placed the vial in his cupboard and went to work blowing more roses out of glass. Presently, he happened to think the medicine might not keep, so he started to ask the wizard about it. But when he reached the door, the glass dog barked so fiercely that he dared not knock and returned in great haste to his own room. Indeed, the poor man was quite upset at so unfriendly a reception from the dog he had himself so carefully and skillfully made. The next morning, as he read his newspaper, he noticed an article stating that the beautiful Miss Midas, the richest young lady in town, was very ill and the doctors had given up hope of her recovery. The glassblower, although miserably poor, hardworking, and homely of feature, was a man of ideas. He suddenly recollected his precious medicine and determined to use it to better advantage than relieving his own ills. He dressed himself in his best clothes, brushed his hair and combed his whiskers, washed his hands and tied his necktie, blackened his hose and sponged his vest, and then put the vial of magic cure-all in his pocket. Next, he locked his door, went downstairs, and walked through the streets to the grand mansion where the wealthy Miss Midas resided. The butler opened the door and said, No soap, no chromos, no vegetables, no hair oil, no books, no baking powder. My young lady is dying and we're well supplied for the funeral. The glassblower was grieved at being taken for a peddler. My friend, he began proudly. But the butler interrupted him, saying, No tombstones either. There's a family graveyard and the monuments built. The graveyard won't be needed if you permit me to speak, said the glassblower. No doctors, sir. They've given up on my young lady, and she's given up on the doctors, continued the butler calmly. I'm no doctor, returned the glassblower, nor are the others. But what is your errand? I called to cure your young lady by means of a magical compound. Step in, please, and take a seat in the hall. I'll speak to the housekeeper, said the butler, more politely. So we spoke to the housekeeper, and the housekeeper mentioned the matter to the steward, and the steward consulted the chef, and the chef kissed the young lady's maid and sent her to see the stranger. Thus are the very wealthy hedged around with ceremony, even when dying. When the lady's maid heard from the glassblower that he had a medicine which would cure her mistress, she said, I'm glad you came. But, said he, if I restore your mistress to health, she must marry me. I'll make inquiries and see if she's willing, answered the maid, and went at once to consult Miss Midas. The young lady did not hesitate for an instant. I'd marry any old thing than die, she cried. Bring him here at once. So the glassblower came poured the magic drop into a little water, gave it to the patient, and the next minute Miss Midas was as well as she had ever been in her life. Dear me, she exclaimed. I have an engagement at the fitter's reception tonight. Bring my pearl-colored silk, Marie, and I will begin my toilet at once. And don't forget to cancel the order for the funeral flowers and your morning gown. But Miss Midas, remonstrated the glassblower who stood by, you promised to marry me if I cured you. I know, said the young lady, but we must have time to make proper announcement in the society papers and have the wedding cards engraved. Call tomorrow and we'll talk it over. The glassblower had not impressed her favorably as a husband, and she was glad to find an excuse for getting rid of him for a time, and she did not want to miss the fritter's reception. Yet the man went home filled with joy, for he thought his stratagem had succeeded and he was about to marry a rich wife who would keep him in luxury forever afterward. The first thing he did on reaching his room was to smash his glassblowing tools and throw them out the window. He then sat down to figure out ways of spending his wife's money.
The following day, he called upon Miss Midas, who was reading a novel and eating chocolate creams as happily as if she had never been ill in her life. Where did you get the magic compound that cured me? She asked. From a learned wizard, said he, and then, thinking it would interest her, he told her how he had made the glass dog for the wizard, and how it barked and kept everyone from bothering him. How delightful, she said. I've always wanted a glass dog that could bark. But there's only one in the world, he answered, and it belongs to the wizard. You must buy it for me, said the lady. The wizard cares nothing for money, replied the glass blower. Then you must steal it for me, she retorted. I can never live happily another day unless I have a glass dog that can bark. The glass blower was much distressed at this, but said he would see what he could do, for a man should always try and please his wife, and Miss Midas had promised to marry him within a week. On his way home, he purchased a heavy sack, and when he passed the wizard's door and the pink glass dog ran out to bark at him, he threw the sack over the dog, tied the opening with a piece of twine, and carried him away to his own room. The next day, he sent the sack by messenger boy to Miss Midas with his compliments, and later in the afternoon, he called upon her in person, feeling quite sure he would be received with gratitude for stealing the dog she so greatly desired. But when he came to the door and the butler opened it, what was his amazement to see the glass dog rush out and began barking at him furiously? Call off your dog, he shouted in terror. I can't, sir, answered the butler. My young lady has orders the glass dog to bark whenever you call here. You'd better look out, sir, he added, for if it bites you, you might have glassophobia. This so frightened the poor glass blower that he went away hurriedly, but he stopped at a drugstore and put his last dime in the telephone box so he could talk to Miss Midas without being bitten by the dog. Give me Pelf 6742, he called. Hello, what is it? said a voice. I want to speak with Miss Midas, said the glass blower. Presently, a sweet voice said, This is Miss Midas. What is it? Why have you treated me so cruelly and set the glass dog on me? asked the poor fellow. Well, to tell the truth, said the lady, I don't like your looks. Your cheeks are pale and baggy, your hair is coarse and long, your eyes are small and red, your hands are big and rough, and you are bow-legged. But I can't help my looks, pleaded the glass blower, and you really promised to marry me. If you were better looking, I'd keep my promise, she returned. But under the circumstances, you are no fit mate for me. And unless you keep away from my mansion, I shall set my glass dog on you. Then she dropped the phone and would have nothing more to say. The miserable glass blower went home with a heart bursting with disappointment and began tying a rope to the bedpost by which to hang himself. Someone knocked at the door. And upon opening it, he saw the wizard. I've lost my dog, he announced. Have you indeed? replied the glass blower, tying a knot in the rope. Yes, someone has stolen him. That's too bad, declared the glass blower, indifferently. You must make me another, said the wizard. But I cannot. I've thrown away all my tools. Then what shall I do? asked the wizard. I do not know, unless you offer reward for the dog. But I have no money, said the wizard. Offer some of your compounds then, suggested the glass blower, who was making a noose in the rope for his head to go through. The only thing I can spare, replied the wizard thoughtfully, is a beauty powder. What? cried the glass blower, throwing down the rope. Have you really such a thing? Yes, indeed. Whoever takes the powder will become the most beautiful person in the world. If you offer that as a reward, said the glass blower eagerly, I'll try and find the dog for you. For above anything else, I long to be beautiful. But I warn you, the beauty will only be skin deep, said the wizard. That's all right, replied the happy glass blower. When I lose my skin, I shan't care to remain beautiful. Then tell me where to find my dog and you shall have the powder, promised the wizard. So the glass blower went out and pretended to search. And by the by, he returned and said, I've discovered the dog. You will find him in the mansion of Miss Midas. The wizard went at once to see if this were true. And sure enough, the glass dog ran out and began barking at him. Then the wizard spread out his hands and chanted a magic spell which sent the dog fast asleep. When he picked him up and carried him to his own room on the top floor of the tenement house. Afterward, he carried the beauty powder to the glass blower as a reward, and the fellow immediately swallowed it and became the most beautiful man in the world. The next time he called upon Miss Midas, there was no dog to bark at him, and when the young lady saw him, she fell in love with his beauty at once. If only you are counter a prince, she sighed, I'd willingly marry you. But I am a prince, he answered, the prince of dog blowers. 
Ah, said she, then if you are willing to accept an allowance of four dollars a week, I'll order the wedding cards engraved. The man hesitated, but when he thought of the rope hanging from his bedpost, he consented to the terms. So they were married, and the bride was very jealous of her husband's beauty and led him a dog's life. So he managed to get into debt and made her miserable in return. As for the glass dog, the wizard set him barking again by means of his wizardness and put him outside the door. I suppose he is there yet, and I'm rather sorry, for I should like to consult the wizard about the moral to this story. Thank you for joining me for this early preview of my new podcast of Now and Then. I'm busy recording more episodes and will be officially launching the show on January 1st, 2017. Here's a preview of what you can expect when we come back next year. Torches flared murkily on the revels in the mall, where the thieves of the East held carnival by night. In the mall they could carouse and roar as they liked, for honest people shunned the quarters, and watchmen, well paid with stained coins, did not interfere with their sport. Along the crooked, unpaved streets with the heaps of refuse and sloppy puddles, drunken roisters staggered, roaring. Steel glinted in the shadows where wolf preyed on wolf, and from the darkness rose the shrill laughter of women and the sounds of scufflings and strugglings. Torchlight licked luridly from broken windows and wide thrown doors, and out of those doors stale smells of wine and rank sweaty bodies, clamor of drinking jacks and fists hammered on rough tables, snatches of obscene songs rushed like a blow in the face. For more updates, follow me on Twitter at of now and then. If you would like to support the show, there are links to our Patreon and official t-shirts at ofnowandthen.com. That's all for now. See you all soon for more stories from Of Now and Then. In high school, we played a game. Many years later, we got back together to play one more. Little did we know, this time, the game was real. Join me, Aram Vartian, on Start Playing Games for a brand new type of fantasy role-playing. In Die RPG, you play a group of real-world, deeply flawed adults who are transported into a fantasy realm via a predatory, sinister role-playing game. The game transforms your characters into paragons and rewards them with strange and frightening powers. In Die RPG, you are confronted with your truest desires and deepest fears. And only you can decide when the game is over. Check out all of my available Start Playing Games campaigns at aram.gay. This show was produced and edited by Dead Ghost Productions. Find out more about us and all the shows we make at deadghostpro.com. <laughs>